Hi, um, thank you for staying so late. Um, the title of my project is Evaluating the Impacts of Transboundary Air Pollution from China to the U.S. Using a Regression Framework. Um, I'm Nicole No from the University of Oregon, and this is co-authored work with Xiao Jia Bao from Xiamen University and Nan Zhang from Columbia University. Um, so many studies have shown the long-range transport of air pollution from Asia to the U.S. And in our study, we're particularly interested in China, um, since currently they're the largest emitter of anthropogenic air pollution in the world. And many studies that have observed this relationship have used chemical transport models, remote sensing, um, in situ observations, and to a lesser degree, um, statistical models. And the major reason for this is obtaining um, as far as I know, is obtaining detailed, rich air quality data sets in China. Um, so to give you some background, um, the ministry, China's Ministry of Environmental Protection, started measuring air pollution um, back in 2000, and they measured around 42 cities that they monitored. And by uh, 2013, the number of cities they monitored increased to about 120. And so within the past decade and a half, there's been a large expansion in their air pollution monitoring network. Um, so we obtain and use um, daily air quality data across cities in China um, in our study to look at um, this relationship and further this literature. Oops. Um, so the objective of our study was to evaluate the impacts of particulate matter in China on um, air quality in California using a linear regression model. And we focus on particulate matter because as most of you know, PM10 is a dominant pollutant um, in China. Um, so, for example, China's air quality is measured by its air pollution index, um, which is calculated by measuring 24-hour averages of SO2 and NO2 and PM10. Um, and then they convert these numbers into a normalized index, and then they take the maximum among those three pollutants, and that represents that day's air pollution index, or API. Um, and at least in our data, at least 90% of the time, um, PM10 represents that day's API. And this makes sense um, since PM2.5 is often used as a measure of urban air pollution, which would be reflected in PM10. So how do we observe this relationship? Um, so first we'll start with a very simple model. We say that air pollution in California is some function of air pollution in China and these other factors which are captured in this vector X. Um, and our goal here is to statistically isolate the impacts of pollution in China on pollution in California. And our outcome variables of interest are PM10, PM2.5, and um, elemental carbon, or EC, in California. Um, and for now, we assume the, this relationship is linear, so we use a linear regression model. And so we use two different approaches to observe this relationship. Um, first, we use a daily lag model. And this is a way to get at the impacts of individual um, daily pollution in China on today's air quality in California. Um, so, for example, the results from such a model will tell us the marginal impact of a one microgram per meter cubed increase, um, for example, from PM10 in China 10 days ago on today's air quality in California. And then um, one con to using daily lag model is that there may not be enough day-to-day -day variation to exploit. Um, so a second approach we use is a lagged event study. Um, so if we take a step back and think about sort of the optimal way we would measure this using statistics, it would be a randomized control trial study. Um, obviously, randomizing pollution um, in, in, in China that's transferred to, uh, to the US is um, logistically and ethically infeasible. And so in the social sciences and more recently in public health, more studies have appealed to natural or quasi-experiments, where you could think of treatment as being assigned outside the experiment and not by the researcher. So we could consider this as good as random. And so a good example of this is Chinese New Year which is a major week-long holiday when a lot of industries and businesses shut down. Um, and it celebrates Lunar New Year, uh, which is different than what our traditional calendar year is. And so, for example, some years, Chinese New Year occurs late January, early February. And in which case, the timing of Chinese New Year is unlikely correlated to factors that affect pollution trends in California. Um, in which case, that's one way to statistically distinguish air pollution in China um, from other factors that affect air quality in California. And so following up on that, um, we focus on events that we would expect to have major impacts on pollution levels in China. Um, so as I just, and here's just a timeline showing when they occur, uh, between 2000 and 2013, which is our period of interest. 
Um, and so we include Chinese New Year, as I discussed, um, sandstorms, which have been shown to have an increase in local pollution levels in China, as well as, of course, the 2008 Beijing Olympics, which have been extensively studied. Um, and so first we conduct our own regression analysis, um, looking at the impact of these individual events on daily PM10 in China. And so the first row here in this table um, tells us that the impact of the 2008 Beijing Olympics is associated with a reduction of 13.4 micrograms per meter cubed of daily PM10. Um, and to put that result in perspective, within our data set, uh, average daily PM10 in China is around 90 micrograms per meter cubed. Um, so similarly, with Chinese New Year, we find, we find a statistically significant reduction in daily PM10. Um, and in sandstorms, we see an increase, which is what we'd expect. Uh, we also considered the 2003 SARS outbreak, when a lot of businesses and schools shut down, um, but we found no impact, and so we don't include that in the rest of our analysis. Um, so here's just a graph showing um, average monthly trends of PM, um, which was discussed in the previous talk, um, using the data from the Chinese Ministry of Environmental Protection. And between 2000 and 2012, um, the orange line here shows average monthly PM10 um, in China. And then, as was discussed, um, the blue line, show, or the green line shows, blue, okay, anyways, this um, top line here shows average pollution in China, um, in North China, because um, as some of the previous talks discussed, a lot of industries and urban areas are located there, so we expect to see higher pollution levels. Um, which might have a bigger impact on pollution in California. And with, at least within the first half of the 2000s, that seems to be true. And we define North China as any city um, above 30 degrees north latitude. And then the bottom three lines here show um, average monthly PM10 in California, PM2.5 in California, and elemental carbon in California. And so now we'll move on to results. Um, for now, due to time constraints, I'll only show results where wind direction is coming from the west in California. And so if you recall, um, we use two different approaches to consider this question. Um, first, we use a daily lag model, and then we use um, a lagged event study. So just to give you an idea of how we might expect marginal impacts to change over time uh, with the daily lag model, um, here's a graph showing impacts of lag daily pollution in China on today's air quality in California and how we expect these um, impacts to trend. And so the y-axis here is marginal impact. The x-axis here is time, <coughs> excuse me, where this red line represents the contemporaneous effect. That is the effect of today's air quality in China on today's um, air quality in California. And of course, we expect that relationship to be insignificant, so we kind of use that as a, as a reference point. And the literature notes that um, the long-range transport of air pollution um, takes between 5 and 14 days. And of course, this varies by pollutants, but for now, this is a period that we consider of interest. We expect to see a peak between 5 and 14 days um, of pollution from 5 to 14 days ago on today's air quality in California. And so here's the result for the daily lag model. Um, again, due to time constraints, I'm only showing limited results. Um, but this shows the effect of average pollution in North China um, during the springtime. And here we focus on spring because that's when the long-range transport of air pollution um, from Asia to the U.S. is most encouraged um, due to these different meteorological mechanisms. Um, and so panel A here shows impacts on today's PM10 in California. And so again, the y-axis shows marginal impacts. This is x-axis is time. And then T is the contemporaneous effect, which we, affect, which we expect to be zero. So the way we interpret this graph is that Let's focus on this point here um, at t minus 10. So this coefficient, and I should note the, um, the lines are 95% confidence intervals. And so this point tells us that the impact of a 1 microgram per meter cubed increase um, in China from 10 days ago has a 0 0.05, is associated with a 0 0.05 increase in today's PM10 in California. And then like I said earlier, we expect to see a subsequent reduction. Uh, where pollution at levels tend, um, will hover around zero, uh, which we sort of is exhibited in this um, panel. But you should also note that um, the standard errors on this point are relatively large, um, so it makes it more difficult to infer the impact on PM10 in California today. Um, however, in panel B, when we look at the impacts on um, today, 
today's PM2.5 in California, the pattern is a bit more clear, where again, um, ten, pollution from 10 days ago in China, has the, we see this peak around there, um, and then a subsequent reduction, where again, coefficients tend to hover around zero. And then similarly with EC, we see sort of a similar pattern, except here we see two peaks, and then again, a subsequent reduction. And then, of course, next we observe the impact of a lagged event um, of on ch from China on today's air quality in California, um, where again the y-axis is the marginal impact, x-axis is time, this red line is the contemporaneous effect. So this shows the impact of a clean event in China. And by that I mean a, an event that should reduce pollution emissions in China, like Chinese New Year or um, the Beijing Olympics. And again, we kind of focus on this 5 to 14 day period that's noted in the literature. Um, except since these events last a few days, we don't use a daily lag model. Instead, we look at the impact on whether an event occurred one or two weeks ago from the first day of that event. And so here are results for Chinese New Year, uh, where column one shows impacts on today's PM10 in California. Column two shows impacts on today's PM2.5. And then column three shows impacts on um, today's EC, or elemental carbon. Um, and I've highlighted in bold results that are statistically, statistically significant at the 5% level or less. And again, T represents the contemporaneous effect in this first row, which we expect to be zero or insignificant. Um, and then we look at the impact one week ago, two weeks ago, and include eight weeks ago as another falsification test. And with respect to Chinese New Year, we see that if Chinese New Year occurred one week ago, um, it has a negative impact on today's PM10 in California. Um, similarly with PM2.5, we see that Chinese New Year occurred two weeks ago, um, has a negative effect. And again, to put these results in perspective, um, average daily PM10 in California is 25 micrograms per meter cubed, um, while average PM2.5 in um, California is 12 micrograms per meter cubed. Um, so it's a relatively large impact. Um, and then we look at the 2008 Beijing Olympics, uh, which we define that period as between July 20th to two, September 20th, 2008, though some papers um, cite a different period, this is the one that we focus on. Um, and again, we look at the contemporaneous effect, the effect if the Olympics occurred one week ago, two weeks ago, and since this event was much longer as a falsification test, we look at whether or not the impact um, during the same time period, one year later and one year ago. Um, with respect to PM10, um, this is for some reason we see a positive impact, um, which is surprising on the contemporaneous effect. Um, with respect to PM2.5, we see a negative impact if the Olympics occurred one or two weeks ago. Um, however, you should also note that we see during the same time period um, last, the previous year, we also see a negative impact. So, um, in which case it's difficult to infer the results since it doesn't necessarily pass the falsification test, um, though this is something that we're still exploring. And then we see something similar with elemental carbon. And then finally, look at the impact on sandstorms. Um, with respect to PM10, we see a positive impact if sandstorms occurred um, two weeks ago, um, which we might expect since um, sandstorms tend to include coarse particles, which would be captured by PM10. However, in PM2.5, again, we see this um, negative impact, negative contemporaneous effect, as well as this um, impact from one week ago, um, making it more difficult to infer these results. Um, but again, this is something we're still exploring. Um, so just a quick conclusion, we find an effect from lag daily pollution and events in China. Um, the next steps is that we recently obtained um, daily emergency department data for respiratory disease and heart disease in California between 2005 and 2012. So the next step is to look at health impacts. Um, this includes about 26 million observations. And so this is something that we're interested in further pursuing. Um, as I said earlier, we first assumed a linear relationship. So of course we're interested in looking at nonlinearities the impact of individual cities in China, or perhaps on individual cities in California, and other pollutants, as well as other robustness checks. Two questions. <laughs> yes. You consider using back trajectory models to just check the air mass transfer uh, velocity in the times that you're looking at, because you got these two different signals of PM10 and PM2.5 in both cases. Oh, for the sandstorms. Yeah, so um, my background's in economics, so I'm using econometric techniques. So I'll say right now, I'm not as interested in meteorological mechanisms, though I know that's been popular um, and has been used. Um, but it would be something, you know, if I found someone else I could co-author with, which I'm more than happy to talk to any of the atmospheric scientists who want to talk more about this, that would be something I would consider. Yes. 
Yeah. Okay. So um, I should note that um, with respect to so we're, so again, I'm, since I'm not coming at it from it as an atmospheric science point of view, like it would be. So I do include um, meteorological and I do include those kind of controls for weather, ge geography, and seasonality. I think it'd be great if there's some way I can account for these different types of you know other meteorological mechanisms like a cold front, which I know encourages these, the long range transport. Um, but how I would do that in statistical model isn't entirely clear to me yet, and how I would put that in the data set. But again, that's something I'm interested in exploring. Um, and like I said, there, we d conducted a, a lot more regression analysis than the results have shown, and robustness is always a concern. Um, and so that's something that we're um, still interested in looking at. Okay. Oh, you think, so that was one problem with thinking about the statistical model, because in the literature, it's, it's varied, right? Some muscle models say nine, some might say, like, it, it depends on the model. So here I'm just saying that there's an association, you know. Well, oh. in the interest of time. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm more than happy to talk about this afterwards, though. <laughs> okay. 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 Last talk is uh, about the same subject. Uh,